Welcome in to the 14. It is Thursday morning. I'm with Barry Allen and Blake Lovell. We got a lot of baseball to talk today, so let's jump right into it. Barry, we had a couple of non-conference games last night. I don't know that there are a lot of significance, but some interesting stuff in there. So let's start there. Yeah, I, as we get closer to the tournament, these midweek games become less and less exciting, even for me. Um, but last night, just a couple of, you know, North Florida, you know, battle back and had to lead on South Carolina and the Gamecocks end up winning the game late seven to six and a game that was postponed from Tuesday to Wednesday due to bad weather. And then, you know, not a lot of significance in Mississippi state bashing the Citadel last night, 10 to two in Charleston, you know, on their way to Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Brad Cumbest, the, the football tight end continues to wreak havoc on college baseball pitchers. Hit a had a two-run single and a two-run homer. I mean, a massive two-run homer last night. Uh, homered now in two straight games, two homers, seven RBI in his last two games. But the, the sole purpose of that trip last night was uh, the first ever meeting between the Bulldogs and the Bulldogs, and which guaranteed the Bulldogs were going to win. But uh, the return of Chris Lamonis to Charleston and his alma mater, the Citadel, where he and uh, Dan McDonald, uh, the Louisville head coach, teamed up for three years together under the legendary Chow Port and actually took the Citadel to the College World Series in 1991. Probably something that will never happen again, but uh, a great deal for him last night. They talked about him extensively on the Citadel uh, broadcast. They took the radio version and put it on the ESPN Plus uh, telecast last night, which I which I watched, and uh, they raved all night long about Chris Lamonis and how good he was as a player. Uh, still holds some Citadel records. Um, led the you know set the single season home run record, the doubles record the year he was there, and you know he and uh, Dan McDonald combined to you know three good years under Chow Port, and obviously you know now both are head coaches, and and you know Chris spent a lot of time with Dan you know, at Louisville before going to Indiana and then coming to Mississippi State. So a nice story last night in Charleston, you know, for Chris Lamonis to return home and and uh, lead Mississippi State to a, to a big win over his alma mater, the Citadel Bulldogs, before heading to Columbia this weekend. Well, sometimes there are little things that you find in these games. And one thing that I've noticed in watching State, they've had a big problem in left field. They just have not been able to find anybody who can hit or – or defend when I've watched them all that well. And Cumbest is a big kid. Like you said, he's a tight end on the football team. He's hitting 383 this year. Now it's in 60 at bats, and a lot of that probably is coming against midweek teams. But State's issue is lower order hitting. I mean, they've got Tanner Allen and Rowdy Jordan have been pretty good at the top of that order. In fact, they've been outstanding in SEC play. But it's once you get into six, seven, eight, nine, where – it gets a little wobbly for the Bulldogs. And so maybe that's a takeaway from them as they found someone who can help them and left. It's probably probably too big a conclusion to say from a midweek game with the Citadel. But you mentioned he's been hitting a little bit now. And uh, if he can shore up a spot that's been a weakness for them, I think that helps because I just think they're so reliant, you know, obviously on their bullpen and on the top of the order. I mean, State's a great team, and I think an Omaha-level team, but there were some things that you'd like to see improve with them, and that's one. Yeah, and if he continues to play the way he's playing, that that Omaha-type team becomes a serious, you know, best-of-three championship game series type team with the pitching that they have. Uh, he's hitting, He's nine for 25 in SEC play, but he's only played 11 games, six starts, has the homer against A&M last weekend, five RBI. So he's he's coming along. He, he's getting some good at bats. He, he he still is a little, you know, gets fooled a little bit. I mean, they 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 fooled him last night. But there's probably a lot of guys that have gotten fooled last night on that on that breaking ball that he struck out on. I think in the sixth or seventh inning in his last at bat that I think almost hit Chris Lamonis in the head in the dugout and swept across. I mean, it was a big bender. And he just, he he was fooled, and that that happens. Uh, I think he struck out twice last night, but he had a two run single and a two run homer. And I think if you could say that Brad Cumbus would be two for four with four RBI and two strikeouts every game, I think they'd take that. And I think he's played really well when he's in the field. And 
And I think that, you know, that he would help them. You know, they've tried Braylon Skinner in the outfield a little bit, but he's only hitting 185 in SEC play. Um, so I think it, I, I think he would be a big key for them down the stretch. And, and he's, he's certainly, at least in the last couple of weeks, seems to be coming into his own and, and playing much better for them. Well, in terms of impact, that actually dropped Mississippi State below TCU in the RPI. Uh, State was two, now three. I, I don't think that in the long term this is going to matter. Uh, there's so many games against great competition coming up uh, that it, it's probably going to come out in the wash. But j- just of note, there was that. And then we had one more game, and that was I've forgotten who. It was the North Florida and South Carolina. Oh, that's South right. Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina is really Carolina. struggling. Goodness. Yeah, they have, and, and this is a huge weekend for them. And I'll, I'll throw one thing on Mississippi State. You know, TCU moved ahead of them in the RPI. TCU also beat them three to two in the tournament in Arlington. That was the only SEC loss in those nine games. I, I not that a tournament in February the nineteenth, you know, hinders your RB, RPIs in in May and June. But you know, I think Mississippi State and Vanderbilt could both finish ahead of TCU in the RPI. But yeah, the Gamecocks are kind of struggling a little bit. You know, we've seen that earlier this year. They, you know, they lost seven in a row earlier this year and, uh, you know, two to Vanderbilt was swept at Texas. And uh, so we've seen them kind of be up and down. And I, I think this is a big weekend for them at home against Mississippi State. You might, well, it's not their last big shot. They've got Kentucky next week and then they close with Tennessee at home the last weekend. So they still have two huge home series left on the schedule. Uh, Mississippi State's been really good, you know, on the road this year. South Carolina has been pretty good at home. Uh, in SEC play, Mississippi State is uh, six and three on the road. The Gamecocks are six and three at home. Uh, but I think this is a big, a big deal for, for South Carolina. The one thing that's for South Carolina that's a, that's a puzzling thing is their their game one in SEC series. They're one and six, so they don't get off to a great start. Uh, and up until last week, they had won all but one game two and game three, and you know they were swept last weekend. So they're they're. 10 and four in games two and three with two of those losses coming last week. So if they can't get off to a good start against Mississippi state this weekend, who happens to be five and two in first games of a series, it could be another tough weekend for them and, and could quite possibly drive them out of a, you know, maybe even a host spot uh, could, you know, could end up obviously a series win could get them really into consideration, but a loss could, you know, could hurt them because I'm not sure Kentucky would do much for them next week, but then they would probably have to win against Tennessee. And if they finish behind Vanderbilt and Tennessee in the standings, that might be, and Florida, which they're behind right now, might be tough for them to host. And they could be, you know, they could be on their way to East Carolina or something, somewhere like that in regional play. So a huge weekend series for the Gamecocks, who seem to be scuffling a little bit as we head towards the stretch run. Yeah, they are. And I want to get back to their hosting chances, but guess who hit another home run in non-conference play? Yeah, Wes Clark. Right. He can only do that in SEC play. <clears throat> I mean, I know he struggled um, against league pitching. I think we had him uh, Sunday 11 for 72 with about 31 strikeouts in league play. Hit his first home run in an SEC game at Ole Miss last weekend over a month uh, when he hit one at Georgia. But, you know, he takes care of the midweek. If we could, if they could get him to hitting in the, in the uh, SEC. Because they have a good lineup. I mean, he and Eister and Minden, uh, Khalil at the bottom, and Brady Allen at the top, the leadoff guy. I mean, he's, you know, Brady Allen's as good as Peyton Wilson, Liam Spence, and, you know, any leadoff hitter you want to run out there in this league, he's as good as any of them. And, and, but, you know, Clark, Clark just, I don't know if everybody knows how to pitch him in this league and they don't know how to pitch him out of the league. Uh, I'm obviously the pitching in this league is better than what he's seeing out of the league. I can assure you that he'll see better pitching in the, uh, this weekend than, than anybody North Florida ran out there yesterday. And that's no knock on North Florida. That's just fact. Um, so we see a better pitching on the weekends. He's probably, um, you know, he's probably not, so not real selective. He's probably pressing a little bit too. And, you know, I think he's had, I know the last weekend against Ole Miss, he had a 0 for 4, 4 strikeout game. And I'm pretty sure in the Florida series, he had a 0 for 5, 5 strikeout game uh, against Florida. The same night that, or I think he was 0 for 4 with 4 strikeouts. 
Same night that Judd Fabian was 0 for 6 with five strikeouts. Uh, that was a tough night to be Judd Fabian and Wes Clark in a 14-inning game. They, they were glad to get that thing over with because they were tired of striking out. Um, so the, that's the worry for me for him is, he's, you know, he's like Dave Kingman in the 70s and 80s. He just yeah. strikes out way too much. I mean, it just, you know, it, it, like more than half of his SEC at bats are strikeouts. And, and that's just, I don't know how you fix that. I'm not a hitting coach. I don't know how you I don't know how you fix that, but that that seems to be a real problem for him and for the Gamecocks. Put him in right field and call him Rob Deer. Well, even Rob Deer hit some mammoth home runs. I mean, they called him Bomba Deer for a reason. Uh, but yeah, it, he he just needs some. He, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know how to fix it. I, I'm not the, I'm not a pitch hitting guy, so I, a hitting coach, not a pitching coach either. But I, I don't know how to tell him to fix it. But it's a it just seems like it's a real, a real issue with him. Just a you know, ton, a ton of strikeouts, you know, in in, in every game that he plays. Yeah, and he struck out twenty seven percent of the time. By the way, Fabian, I was checking up on him. He struck out thirty percent of the time, so that's come way down. And this I, is in all games. But here's one other weird thing. I think he's only got six doubles all year. That's odd. Yeah. It, you, it's like he's either strikes out or it's a home run. I mean, it's just his, his, I'm assuming you're talking about Clark, uh, not, not Fabian, but Clark. Correct. Um, Yeah. It's, it's just kind of puzzling to see it, just call his stats up and look at his numbers. And it just, it's just really weird to see, you know, what he's, you know, what he's done non-conference, what he's done in the conference and, and then just look at his numbers. You know, he's got all these home runs, had all these home runs last year, uh, no doubles, ton of strikeouts. I mean, it's just, I mean, he just has a ton of, you know, the strikeouts are just, they just blow your mind when you look at, you know, his numbers. I mean, even in SEC play, you know, he's way down there at the bottom. He's hit 164 in the SEC, 12 for 73. He's got 29 strikeouts in the conference. I mean, this guy has four home runs in the league, 342 slugging percentage. But in the non, but in the overall games, he's hitting 279. He's hit 17 home runs. He struck out 51 times in 147 at bats. I mean, that's just that's crazy. And uh, it just got to cut down on that. I mean, and, and it's not like it's kind of like that. They have you know a lot of guys are like that. I mean, we we're talking about him because of his power numbers. But you look at Brandon uh, or Andrew Eister. He's got 151 at bats, Chris. He struck out 53 times. Yeah, I mean the I, Gamecocks have struck out almost 400 times this year. I mean, I've always remembered them being a home runner, a home runner strikeout kind of team. And there were some times under Ray Tanner where they were really, they were really a difficult team to try to figure out. Because I know a couple of times when Ray Tanner was the head coach, they not only led the SEC in home runs, but they led the SEC in sacrifice bunts. And that's weird. That uh, is weird. They have six. They don't have a lot of those this year. Only six and five from George Khalil and four from Braylon Wimmer. So like three guys have eleven of their sixteen sack bunts. But you look at their strikeouts: Allen thirty-three, Wimmer forty-four, Clark fifty-one, Eister fifty-three, Mendham forty-two. I mean, you know, we talk about West Clark. You know, he's not by himself. <laughs> he's got a lot of guys in there with him, but. You know, swing and miss guys, and and you know there's a ton of strikeouts in that lineup, and now you can see why Kevin Copps had so much success against them in two games, and why Arkansas had a lot of success. I mean, there's a lot of swing and miss in that lineup, but there's also a lot of pop. I mean, 17 bombs for Clark, 11 for Allen, eight for Wimmer, and seven for Eister, and six for Seitler. I mean, there's a lot of guys that can that can run it out or that can run it out of the park, but uh, they they are they are certainly prone to the strikeouts. Yeah, Clark, here's another great stat. He's got 17 home runs and 18 singles. Don't see that often. Uh, and you mentioned SEC play. You said he's hitting 164. He's got a 311 on base, which is not good. And a 342 slugging, so he's really not hitting the ball that hard in league play, at least not per at bat. I mean, it's just been a a bizarre season. He was When we were doing our hitter of the year rankings, oh, when we started this four or five weeks ago, I had him number one. I think the first week, just because his out of conference numbers were so good, and you get two or three weekends in league play, and 
run into some good pitchers and bad luck. And I put a lot of stock in sometimes, especially early in the year, what kind of player do I think you are? And I think we all thought he was a great player. But uh, the, the numbers now have come down so much based on league play that I don't even think I'll put him in my top 14 hitters. I, I mean, I might, but I, I just think when you're when hitting 164 in league play with a 311 on base and a, a sub-53 slugging, that just to me, as many great players that there are in this league, uh, that does not rank. Uh, you've got to give the guys who did more in conference more credit. And I know people are going to look at it and say, my goodness, he's hit 17 home runs. Uh, and I'll say, yes, and most of them come out of conference and there's nothing else there. I mean, he plays DH, too, most of the time, so there's not even value as a fielder. And, and this isn't this isn't run down West Clark Day. That's not what I'm trying to do. But when you start ranking him up against his peers and saying who's the best, uh, there, there's just so many things that are, that are glaring that I, I don't think he's belonging in that discussion anymore. I mean, he could end up leading the nation in home runs, and in my mind, not be a first, second, even third team All SEC player. Oh, absolutely. And you look at you look at him. I mean, he's he's got four home runs in the SEC play, and and uh, Brady Allen has seven uh, as the leadoff hitter, uh, one to lead off the game against Georgia, and, and only has four home runs in the nine conference. So that's you know that's where you're talking about value and guys. We, you know, I think both of us or all three of us, when you look at you know, the value of a player, you know, it's one thing to go out and do that against Dayton and and Wofford and and, and non conference teams like that. But it's another thing to go do it against Florida, Kentucky, you know, Mississippi State, Vanderbilt. And I mean, you know, Brady Allen to me is one of the best hitters in the league, even though he's only hitting two ninety six and one of the best leadoff hitters, but just you know, the first weekend of the season and it's hard to say this, but if he if he doesn't homer in the fourth inning against Vanderbilt and bust up that what was that now twenty seven and nine thirty six consecutive batters retired, he breaks that up. What it was against Schultz on Sunday, and then Wimmer followed with a home run, and all of a sudden the Gamecocks are back in it. You know Brady Allen doesn't homer in that inning, and they go three up, three down, a couple of more innings. I'm not even sure the Gamecocks may be in any kind of conversation for any postseason. That may have turned their season around a little bit because then they started playing really well because they'd lost seven in a row and they had 36 in, in a row retired and they're playing at Vanderbilt and you're, you know, you're kind of sitting there thinking, geez, these guys are, these guys might finish sixth in the division and uh, they may be fighting to get into Hoover. And, and that, that kind of turned them around and they've played well and now they just kind of, they haven't played well of late, but you know they can turn things around this weekend with a you know good home series win against Mississippi State. But I've, I've always I've said all year I thought Brady Allen was his dynamic leadoff hitter. I think he's a spark for them. He gets on base a lot. He's, but you say that, but his on base percentage out of comp and overall is only three eighty two, which is not great, and it's only three twenty in the league. But he has twenty two walks and fifty hits overall. Uh, for the season, four hit by pitches. So, but I still think he's pretty good. He's pretty dynamic leadoff guy, and you know can make things happen. And and just ha like Peyton Wilson at Alabama, just happens to have power to go with it. I can make the argument that the most important series this weekend are Mississippi State at South Carolina and Florida at Kentucky, and here's why. Um, Mark Etheridge, as we said yesterday, has got Florida is, is one of the hosts right now in pretty safely. But as we said, 29 RPI, how much is the NCAA going to factor in RPI in a year where your interconference connectivity is less than it's been uh, in any year we've seen in a long time because of COVID? So that's kind of a guess saying, in his opinion, he thinks the NCAA will devalue RPI which I think he's got a solid case, but we don't know because we're not the NCA. So with that, I think that if Florida goes to Kentucky this weekend and loses two or three, that's going to shine the spotlight on the Gators' record away from home. Uh, and the last impression the committee is going to have going into selecting hosts is going to be a team that could not beat 
a borderline NCAA tournament team on the road and, frankly, has not put up much on the road uh, this year. So, so there's that. And I think South Carolina State is the other one because Carolina right now, I think until last weekend, most of us would have had them hosting because of that record. Now they're 11 and 10. Let's say that you you lose two or three to Mississippi State. Well, you're you're 500. You're 12 and 12. That's not going to get you a hosting spot. It's probably going to eliminate you from the discussion, I would think. But you go two and one, that changes things a lot. All of a sudden, uh, you know, you, you're, you're 13 and 11. Your RPI is top 15. You beat a top 15 RPI team. So to me, those are the t- two most important series just because that turn of a series – uh, on a two to one either way could could really mean a lot, I think, for either program this weekend. It could. Uh, Mississippi State obviously has played well of late. You know, one of the hottest teams in the league. They're twelve and three over the last five weeks. Uh, they've had three sweeps during that span, tied with Ole Miss for the most in the uh, in the SEC. You know, we mentioned that they're a good road team this year too. They've won. You know, they're six and three on the road. You know, swept Auburn on the road. Um, of course, most everybody's done that. Um, and in South Carolina, six and three at home. Um, just making sure I, my mic, I thought, went out, but I'm good. Um, six and three at home. So a big series for both, and 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 one that, you know, even if Mississippi State loses, I don't think it's going to hurt them. A, a lot in the in the regional hosting and the national seed kind of thing, but you know they're trying they're they're now trying to win the SEC. Uh, that's where they're that's where they're going. They're trying to get the SEC championship now, and they see that in their grasp, just a game behind Arkansas, and and they see they see that opportunity to do that. You know, with Missouri and Alabama left on the schedule after this week, you know they got if they could get two out of three this weekend, they're in pretty good shape to you know, have a tremendous end of the season. And they've won four straight series with South Carolina after losing eight of nine between 2002 and 2012. So the Bulldogs have kind of had the Gamecocks number of late. And uh, so that'll be an interesting series in in in, uh, in Columbia this weekend. And you mentioned Florida. You know, Florida's a, a really weird team to try to figure out. Uh, this is This is the best home team in the SEC. These guys are 10 and 2 in SEC home games. They're 3 and 6 on the road in SEC play. The only teams with worse record on the road are I bet you could guess them. Missouri and Texas A&M. Auburn's got a better record. Auburn has won 4 and uh, 4 and 8 wow. on the road in SEC play. Auburn has of Auburn's five wins in conference, four have come on the road. They've only won one. They're the worst home team in the league at one and eight. And then and and just even this year, three and six for Florida, that's that 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 doesn't stop there for the Gators. They've lost seven of their last nine SEC road series. You imagine Florida being two and seven in any stretch, in anything, really in any It sport. is hard to I mean, imagine. Just be yeah. With you. I mean, even like volleyball, I, I don't even know their volleyball team could lose seven of nine road matches. I mean, they're just, I just can't imagine Florida ever being two and seven in anything other than maybe football in the 70s, but when they didn't win a game one year. But I'm just saying the way we see Florida now, to lo- lose seven of their last nine SEC series is just on the road is just mind boggling. And I think a, a couple of weeks ago we had, I, I, I've not updated it, but it, I think I remember texting you one Saturday night and go, do you know Florida's lost 21 of their last 25 road games? Yeah, I remember that. That that was all I was like, like, that was, yeah. I mean, and and granted, a lot of that came in 2019 when that was a really young team that was kind of rebuilding a little bit. But, I mean, Florida's, frankly, baseball may be Florida's best sport. I mean, there was an argument, and and, and I think Vanderbilt winning it in 19 kind of shut it down for the time being. But that could flip again this year. But the, the argument for the best two baseball programs in the country basically was Florida and Vanderbilt. And, you know, you could pick a side and defend it pretty easily. But, yes, that, that is kind of astonishing given the level of that program. And, again, with an explanation that 
that we didn't have a last year and that two years ago was was kind of a rare rebuilding year for them. Ironically, I think, didn't they go to Missouri and sweep the series on the road uh, to get into the SEC tournament, which absent that, they wouldn't have gotten in or the NCAA tournament. So there, there was a little a footnote in there, although I would say it came against Missouri. But, well, yeah, I mean, they they, um, they they lost. They got swept at South Carolina, and they lost two or three at Tennessee, and the one they won was by a run. And their series win on the road this year is, guess where? Auburn. Auburn, right. Yeah. If you talk about they've lost seven of their last nine SEC road series, one of those two is at Missouri. So if you factor Missouri out, they've lost seven of eight because <laughs> seems like a lot of people unfortunately from Missouri went at Missouri but yeah it's just I such a different team at home and on the road and 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 I didn't think Vanderbilt played particularly well against Florida last weekend and that's that's not making an excuse for Vanderbilt but really and truly I didn't think Florida played all that good either no I, mean, I I've seen both play better they, yeah. they you know they got you know, they're they're so far behind in the opener against Rocker and then came back and you know, they still in the game they won Saturday, they gave up eight runs. So, you know, they got nineteen runs in two games and they're one and one and what Vanderbilt gave up about the same nineteen runs. I think they both gave up nineteen runs in the first two games. I mean, I've seen much better pitching for both sides than that. And, and the last time, you know, when they played Auburn two weeks ago, they ran Mace and Leftwich out in the same game and they gave up ten runs. So they they got to figure it out on the road and 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 they can and they've got the players and the and the and the pitching to do it but they, they that's a big series for them on the road this weekend at Kentucky and it's a and it's probably a a win not a win or go home but it's a much, it's a big win series win for Kentucky if they can get it keeps them in the talk for an NCAA tournament bid. Okay, Kentucky at home this year uh swept Milwaukee which is nothing. Uh Lost two or three, including a pair of one-run games to Ball State, which is pretty good. I guess might win the MAC. Uh, swept Georgia State, which I thought was good at the time. That season's turned into a disaster. Took two or three against Missouri, and lost two or three against LSU, including a, a fifteen to two hammering on Friday night. Although they they kind of got that back on Sunday with the fifth or thirteen to four. And then beat Alabama two out of three last weekend. So I I just look at this and like they're not playing really good teams at home that are Florida level to where it's hard to know. Uh, but again, like you said, with the Gators playing so poorly on the road, it's it's hard to to know if they can beat a decent team anywhere at this point. So that that to me is very interesting because from the Kentucky side of things, Barry. We've said, you know, the record's good, and I think you're 10-11 in the SEC no matter who you play. There's so many good teams that, that to me, gets you in the conversation. And I want to say D1 had them in this week. I'll look that up. But Kentucky gets that one, and I think that has to leave them on the right side of the bubble, wouldn't you think? I, if they win this series, I think it does. You talk about they're 10-11, and 11, they're tied with Georgia. Uh for fifth in the league, they lost the series at Georgia, but you talk about their ten win, their, you know, ten SEC wins. They have two against Missouri. They have three against Auburn. That's five. Two against Alabama. That's seven, and one against LSU. That's eight. So they're they're feasting on the teams that are at their level or below, and they're not getting a whole lot done against the better teams. I would put Florida in the category as a better team. So I'm just not sure that they're going to be able to even the, even with Florida's road woes this year and of late. I'm just not sure that they're going to be able to accomplish much against the Gators this weekend. Um, you know who who plan are playing better. I mean they've won their last three series and, and are playing better. And they they just need to go and win a you know they won a road series at Auburn and that was at Auburn. But they're eight and two in their last ten SEC games. Uh, overall, so I think I think the Gators know that this is a big weekend for them, and if they can get two or three, get to sixteen and eight, maybe Tennessee and Vanderbilt, you know, goes two and we'll both go two and one this weekend, and then all of a sudden, hey, we got a log jam atop the SEC East with the old Florida Gators just hanging around, and, and, and you know, a chance to 
you know, chance to make some noise with Georgia and Arkansas the last two weeks. So Florida's still very much in this, and, and this is a big weekend for both of them uh, in, in Lexington. Okay, D1 had Kentucky in one of its first five out. Again, I, I just think it's what we said. It's, it's lack of quality wins, but this would be an opportunity to get two, maybe three. I think three would be a stretch, but I could see Kentucky – winning this series, uh, given the way that, that Florida plays on the road again. Now, the other team that's in that bubble right now, and I guess they've got Alabama squarely in at this point. Uh, I'll have to double-check that. But D1's got Georgia as one of the last five in, and that could get really dicey for the Bulldogs in a hurry because here's what they've got left. At Arkansas, at Florida, Ole Miss. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a good recipe for. That, that's for what we success. call problematic. Yes, <laughs> but it's also um, a good opportunity for a team who needs wins to jump in there and go, "Hey, we won, we won six of the last nine against three really, really good teams." And if they do that, I don't think there's any question about them being in. I think they would make that. Uh, I just don't know that they can get. I don't know if they can get there. Uh, they're the, they're they're among Oklahoma State, Iowa, Tulane, and San Diego as the last five in, uh, according to D1. I don't believe he had Alabama in this week. Um, yeah, no, I'm not seeing. I just presume yeah, they did because they weren't even think, on the margins. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they're. I don't think they had them in, and I don't even think they're among the last five out. Uh, even though they've won four in a row, and I know they dropped. They and Florida swapped places in the Warren Nolan RPI yesterday. Uh, with that. So Georgia, they've got them projected as a three seed in Eugene, uh, taking on Gonzaga. Of course, that's just projections. But, you know, Georgia, you know, I, I think I think the home series loss to Florida last weekend is a, you know, it's just a, it's a killer. I mean, it just, and people will see that. Well, what have you done in the last four weeks? And go, oh, you're the only team that lost to Auburn all year. Wow. And that, you know, I don't know that that's going to happen. I think Auburn has some opportunities for some series wins the last three weekends of the season. But, uh, you know, that that that's going to resonate, I think, with the committee and resonate with people that, you know, you 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 2-0 and against Clemson, and that's not one of Clemson's better teams. You lost to Georgia Tech. Middle of the pack ACC team, uh, or in that, I say middle of the pack in that 33 to 53 RPI bubble where there's, you you can roll out 33 to 53 in there and shake them out, and seven ACC teams are going to fall out about every time because that's about where all those that's about where all those teams are. Um, so it's a big it's it's a big last three weekends for Georgia and and you know going to Arkansas, I I, I can't. I can't see them winning this series. Uh, Florida's been really good at home. I, I don't. I don't know about that one. And Ole Miss at Ole Miss in Athens to end the season. You know, Ole Miss could still be playing for the Western Division title, and you know, could still be in the hunt for their Super Regional at that point. So, I it's a tough road for Georgia. And the Auburn series loss last weekend certainly didn't help. Okay, I'm looking more at Alabama's resume, and it's one of those things that you're like, wait a minute, 11 and 10 in the SEC, that alone has to get you in, right? Uh, but then you look at it, and they are 6 and 10 against the RPI top 50, but it gets worse from there. Against the top 25, they have won five and lost, what, seven? Uh, excuse me, they're five and eight, but it's kind of worse than that because Two of those top 25 wins, or three of them are right state. Now, nothing against the Raiders. They're a really good Horizon League team and probably going to win that league. And But that is a resume that's propped up by just playing teams. Uh, you know, they, they went to Vandy. They went to Alabama. I think they went somewhere else. And so the RPI is weird in that way where you can – you know, you, you can lose a series 30 to 1 on the road, but if you're playing good RPI teams, you can actually move up for that. And I think, not that it's that dramatic with Wright State, but my point is three of the wins come at Wright State, which I don't think the NCAA is going to look at despite the 17 RPI and say that's the 17th best team. So you look at it, they took one of three from Tennessee and one of three from Arkansas. Arkansas on the road, Tennessee at home. 
uh, lost a one-run game to Tennessee, lost a two-run game to Arkansas, and of course thrashed Arkansas 16-1. to So I, I, you could make the argument that they played those teams pretty well, uh, swept against Ole Miss in two games that were close and one game that wasn't, uh, and then a midweek loss to Southern Miss in there 5-4. to So rearrange Alabama's luck a little bit, give them a, a one- or two-run win there, uh, th- then that changes things, but that's not how it works. Uh, furthermore, losing two or three at Kentucky, which is going to get compared to Alabama right there on that bubble. The Wildcats' RPI is worse, but they won head-to-head two or three. Uh, so really this is a, a thing where Alabama, goodness gracious, you look at what the Tide has to do, and, and you say winning a series at Vandy this weekend would would. I don't want to say a prerequisite because you get opportunities on the back end. If you can beat Mississippi State in a series at home, then maybe you get it there. But I, I think I think Alabama has got to probably pick up either a series win at Vanderbilt or at home against Mississippi State in order to get into the NCAA tournament. Now, boring if, if they make a big run in Hoover. Okay, then that changes things a little bit. But you dig into Alabama's resume, and it has a problem with a lack of quality wins. Yeah, and they're in the same boat with Kentucky. You know, I talked about Kentucky a minute ago, and you look at their, you know, the teams that are at their level or worse, that's where they're the best. I mean, they have three wins against A&M, two wins against Auburn, and three wins against Missouri. Well, there's eight of their ten wins right there. So you've got one win at Arkansas and one win against Tennessee. And you got close losses, but, I mean, losses are losses. I mean, this isn't hand grenades and horseshoes. I mean, you either win or you lose. I mean, there's a lot of people lose close games. Uh, you know, a friend of mine and I have always said, he works in TV, and we've always said, you know, they build these graphics and put them up, you know, football teams, seven of the eight losses by six points or less. And he goes, you know what that means? I said, yeah, it means they're not any good. <laughs> they don't know how to win. I said, <laughs> so, and he laughs. He goes, exactly. And and I'm not saying Alabama's not any good, but uh, because they they're better than they have been, but they're still not they're still not in the upper division and elite part of the league. And and, and their schedule on the backside, you know, doesn't do them any favors. You know, they're at Vanderbilt, they're at LSU next week, and they host Mississippi State at home, as you've mentioned. And I mean. Like I, I talk about them every week, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Tide. I mean, I don't know what we're going to get. I mean, they could lose every one of those games. I mean, they 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 really could. Um, I don't think they will, but they could. And uh, you know, I think they're. I, I I think they have to win the series at LSU. And if they can try to somehow find a way to win a game at Vanderbilt, win a game at home against Mississippi State. You know, that gets them to four, and that gets them 15 and 15, and I think they get to 15 and 15. In this league, I think that I think that's merit to get in, even if they go one and one, oh and one, one and two in Hoover. I think 15 regular season wins in this league would resonate with the committee, and I think they would have to be a serious contender to get in to get one of the 64 spots. But they got to win. They got to get to 15. I'm not sure 13. I'm not sure 14. I think they won one of the next – one each weekend. I don't know if that's enough. Uh, it could be, but I don't. I don't know because you don't know what everybody else is doing out there and how that how that all works out. But I, I would think traditionally, you got to have at least fourteen or fifteen wins in this league to get in. And I, I, I don't. I don't know if they can get there. Let me throw a scenario at you. <laughs> how about this? How about Georgia stumbles down the finish against Arkansas, Florida, and, and Ole Miss? Again, the first two of those on the road. Alabama doesn't get work done. Uh, Florida takes the series, maybe sweeps Kentucky this weekend. Uh, then, then Kentucky having to get work done, either home against South Carolina or at Vandy. Carolina, I can see Vanderbilt gets tough to bite off. Um, <laughs> what if you see seven teams from the SEC that get in the tournament that's it, and all seven are hosting. Now, now, how would that be for crazy? Well, it would be crazy, but it's not. Uh, I don't think anybody. It's not would impossible, you. right? Yeah, I don't think anybody would schedule you in a visit with a psychiatrist and go, "Man, he's gone nuts. He's gone off the deep end there." I don't know. I don't think that would be. I don't think that'd be crazy at all. I, I, I would hope we would get more teams in than seven. 
and I think we will, and I think you think we will too, but no, that certainly would not be out of the realm of possibility to go, well, they only got seven and they're all hosts and four of them are national seeds and, you know, see you in Omaha, boys. I, no, I don't, I don't think that'd be crazy at all. all right, I'm going to throw you another one. What if LSU goes eight and one down the stretch of SEC regular season play? And who's, here's who LSU's got at Auburn, Alabama, at A&M. LSU already 24 in the RPI. I would presume that RPI stays in the top 30. You throw in a 500 conference record. Uh, now, now your issue is quality series wins. I guess it's at Ole Miss. Maybe that's good enough. I don't know. Uh, swept by Tennessee, swept by Vanderbilt. Did take a game from State and from Carolina and from Arkansas. And I think that counts for something. We look at series sweeps and all that. I think sometimes that gets overrated because you're you're eliminating sometimes a third of a week in series, uh, not to mention what you do in the midweek. But that would be interesting. I don't know where LSU's RPI would end up, but I think if it's in the top 30 and you're 15 and 15, now maybe an 0-2 in Hoover uh, could collapse that, especially – given that the other variable is what happens across the country and who's on the bubble at that point, that's just too hard to predict. But LSU is an interesting case. If the Tigers can get hot and just dominate the last three weekends of the schedule, I have a feeling the metrics are going to be too hard to leave the Tigers out. Well, if they get to 15, I think it will be. I mean, I I, I think if LSU and Alabama both get to 15 somehow, I, I don't see how they're going to get left out. I mean, traditionally that's, you know that's been a that's been a magic number to jump in and and you mentioned Auburn, you know their schedule. They've got Auburn on the road this week, and then they host Alabama and they go to A and M. But they've got a big midweek game next Tuesday night at the, at home against Louisiana Tech, which uh, which could really help them too. So you you're looking yeah. at their last ten games. I mean, or eleven they play Northwestern State uh, on Tuesday, May the eighteenth. That's not going to really help them, but. You know, their last 11 games, you know, nine SEC and then a ranked Louisiana Tech team, you know, they can make some things happen there. They, they, they're they they're in, the, they're in the, the process. They're in the talks and the consideration for sure. And, of course, you know, they're the same as we talked about Kentucky and Alabama. I mean, they, they haven't played Auburn and A&M yet. They have seven wins. You know, they have two against Kentucky and two at Ole Miss. I think that Ole Miss series – resonates loud, very loud. They have a win at home against Ar- Arkansas, excuse me, and a win at home against Mississippi State and South Carolina. So they haven't won series, but they've, you know, they haven't been swept and able to win series and keep, you know, keep, uh, you know, keep everything, keep their head above water against some of these, you know, better teams that they played. You know, they did get swept by Vanderbilt. That's my bad. They did. They they were swept at home by Vanderbilt. Uh, that would have helped. That would make them eight and thirteen if they'd have won one game there. But they didn't. But um, I, I think that I think their season is still in front of them. I, I, I mean, they play Auburn this week, who's five and sixteen. They play Alabama next week, who's eleven and ten, and Texas A and M the next week, that's five and sixteen. I mean, their their last three SEC opponents are twenty one and forty two. And they have a they have a chance a chance to you know make some noise and you know the only team with the worst record combined record is Auburn who plays LSU A and M and Missouri um, and so I don't think Auburn's out of it yet I, I mean I don't think they're going to make the NCAA tournament but I think Auburn is you know I think Auburn is is definitely in the mix for Hoover and uh, I, I might be surprised if they don't get in I mean really even though they're they got LSU at home and A and M at home. The one problem for Auburn is they're the worst home team in the league. They're one and eight. They got to they got to win home series, and they're terrible in game one. They're terrible in game three. So they get off to a bad start, and then they can't win the third game. They're one and six in game one, three and four in game two, one and six in game three. Uh, their only game three win was against Georgia last week, and they won the series. Um, but LSU going to Auburn, L- LSU's got a better road record, although it's not great. Four and five. Than they do at home in the SEC, four and five on the road, three and nine at home. They're three and nine at Alex Box in SEC games. Chris, that's just that that's is crazy. I mean, yeah, Skip Burtman's like, for God's sakes, we got to win our home games. I mean, that's just like you would never, ever, ever think LSU would be 
three and nine at home. And, you know, Paul Maneri said yesterday on his teleconference, they said, what does LSU do need to do to get to Hoover and maybe get in the NCAA tournament? He goes, we need to win a series. <laughs> we need to win series. And he said, that's what we need to do. And they have one and they have an opportunity really. And realistically, they have an opportunity to win their last three. I mean, they have it. They, they're, they have a chance to win at Auburn. They have a chance to beat Alabama at home. They have a chance to win at A&M. So if they can do that and, you know, make some noise here, if they beat Tech Tuesday night at home, say they go six and three and then beat Tech at home, and now all of a sudden they're, you know, they're 13 and, well, if they go six and three, they're 13 and 17. I, and I don't know, that 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 13 may be tough. They may have to win seven. They may have to win seven or eight to get in and, not, you know, that may be hard, but they certainly can get into Hoover. And then if they get to Hoover, who knows? And if they make a deep run like they do, because they'll have a lot of LSU fans there, you know, they 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 will be in the conversation. And whether they get in or not, I don't know, but they will be certainly be in the conversation. Well, in LSU's defense a little bit here, I think a lot of teams would struggle with the home schedule that was Mississippi State, South Carolina, Vanderbilt, and Arkansas. So there's that um, <laughs> for context. But yeah, they – they didn't the league didn't do them any favors did they no no they did not um now down the stretch you know at auburn alabama at a&m so again lsu yeah. with with chance to which i guess we already said that with the chance to to make it up but let's look at the the battle for that last spot in hoover because I'd, I'd be shocked if lsu is not there given that it's two ahead of the last three and who's on the schedule you got, let's start with Missouri. Missouri plays Tennessee at home at Mississippi State. Frankly, I could see it getting swept in both. And then Auburn at home. A&M has got Ole Miss at home at Auburn, LSU at home. Um, and then, of course, Auburn's got LSU, A&M, and at Missouri. I, I just think, to me, to me, Auburn, the clear favorite to emerge as the 12th seed and the last team into Hoover. Well, Chris, I think it, it's kind of ironic that the, you know, the teams that are that are fighting for the last spots in Hoover, you know, all play each other the last three weekends of the regular season. I, I don't, I don't know that the schedule gods had anything to do with that, but it just, it, it works out that way. Uh, you know, Auburn and LSU and Texas A&M and Missouri, you know, fighting for the last two spots. Although I think LSU has a, you know, two game lead has a little up for hand. They all play each other. Um, LSU doesn't play Missouri, but Auburn plays A&M, LSU and Missouri, and LSU plays Auburn and A&M, and Missouri plays uh, – Missouri has Auburn the last weekend of the regular season, two very difficult series in between that. But you know, it seems like they all have a, have a shot at each other at the end. Uh, I kind of like Auburn's chances. Uh, their last three teams are 17 and 46 combined – two home series, which you would think, wow, that's, you know, Auburn certainly has the edge there with two home series, but, you know, you know, again, remind you, they're the worst home team in the conference at one and eight, you know, four of their five SEC wins have come on the road, which is really bizarre. Uh, and they close at Missouri. I, I could see, I could see Auburn and Missouri, uh, you know, that series winner, you know, maybe sliding in as a 12 seed, you know, A&M could have something to say about it with, series left against Auburn and uh, and LSU. Uh, they've also lost a series to Missouri already this year. Um, so it, it's an interesting last three weeks, you know, starting tonight with uh, LSU playing at Auburn. That's one of our Thursday night games that we mentioned previously, but actually pretty much all of them playing each other as we enter the final three weeks of the season. But I, I think right now, just looking at it, I, I think LSU is in pretty good shape. You know, to get in, and and if I had to pick one of the three to emerge as the 12 seed, I think I'd give that uh, I'd give that advantage to Auburn at this point, uh, just based on they they won a series last week. Uh, you know, Missouri and A and M are you know really struggling. You know, both Missouri at at, at home is only three and six. A and M is only three and six at home. They're both two and ten on the road. Uh, so next week when A and M and Auburn play, you're gonna have the worst home team playing the worst road team. So somebody's going to win a series out of that. So I, I do think that it'll all shake out. But I, if I had to pick today that who would emerge, I would think that LSU and Auburn will, are going to emerge out of that and be the last two teams to, you know, to get into Hoover. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And we start sorting it out tonight. Tonight being Thursday, LSU and Auburn. That is 7.30 on ESPNU. I think that's Eastern. Um, but in any case, and then you've also got Florida and Kentucky at 7 on the SEC Network. We'll be watching a little bit of those. But anyway, we'll have a lot to talk about. We've got a lot of basketball news that we will digest tomorrow when Blake and I talk on the podcast. we got some transfers. Uh, we've got a late high-profile signing, I guess is a good way to put it, uh, from a freshman. So we got a lot of news in basketball to digest because, uh, God forbid, we don't have basketball news this offseason with the transfer portal. But anyway, we'll dive in that tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Thursday episode of The 14. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at 14 Southeastern. Of course, check our workout at southeastern14.com. All of that free. We got hitter rankings coming this afternoon, so look for those. Thank you for listening to the Thursday edition of the Southeastern 14 podcast. We will see you again on Friday.